Goddard. I work at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Right now, I'm spending most of my time on Mars. I work on an instrument called Sample Analysis at Mars, which is part of the Curiosity rover. When I'm not on Mars, I'm in the laboratory or in the field. And so I'd like to introduce my two colleagues, and then I'll give you a sort of schematic for how we might approach this topic. Um, to my right and to your left is Mary Wojtek, who's the senior scientist for astrobiology at NASA. So all things astro and exobiological fall under Mary's purview. Uh, I met Mary long before she was doing that when she was in the worker bee fashion just like I am. So Mary has quite an extensive background in geomicrobiology. On my left and your right is Penny Boston from New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. She is the babe of all things cave, uh, both biological and geological, and her expertise has become very broad, well beyond just what happens with geology and bi biology in cave systems, but also in many, many environments as she approaches the topic of uh, how one measures habitability and how one understands the limits of life. This topic, which as you all know is searching for life on Mars, is one in which we have a number of ways we could approach it. And I thought the best way would be to use your expertise to help us understand where we might go in the future based upon where we have been in the past, where we are now, and where we think we're heading. And so in that regard, I thought we would do a little bit of a discussion of the history of looking for life, start with Viking's approach, talk a little bit about the approach that was used on the Mars Exploration Rovers and with the Phoenix mission and with the Mars Science Laboratory mission to understand the environment of Mars in terms of the requirements that life places on environments. And then we'll start with our investigation of the future. So I'm going to ask Mary if she would first begin with a little bit of history based upon her expertise of How the... her to find life? <laughs> that We're going to get to the requirements for life. Would you like she to... Wants I me think to define life. Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> oh. just to put it into context, I would argue that it would help if you guys um, first heard from someone about... Um, all of the analysis and measurements that we make tend to be based on what we understand life on Earth is about, what it does, how we recognize it. And so I think going over that makes a lot of sense before I describe missions and what we chose to do. Okay. Is that okay? There you go. Can I be in charge? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, uh, well, I'm happy to try to do that. Uh, you know, any of you who have ever had any kind of biology in school probably know that there's um, <clears throat> a large debate about what actually we mean by life. Um, I think everybody I know has a list of properties that they think are essential. Um, however, no single one of those properties, no even several of those properties in and of themselves are definitive of life. So we are living organisms, and you would think that if we are them, we should know them, <laughs> but it's a much more subtle concept to, uh, to define. And it depends, really, I think, on how broad you cast your net. So um, from the earthly perspective, we know that there are certain uh, properties that life has, um, some of which are attached to the specific chemistry that goes into making up life here. But as we have evolved over the, the last 50, 60 years of, uh, of the space era, when we are thinking more and more broadly about life and, and trying to look for it elsewhere in the universe where it may not have the same chemistry that we do, uh, this has constantly caused us sort of to broaden the envelope of what we consider to be life. And so that laundry list that many of us have of irreducible properties in some cases has gotten shorter, in some cases has gotten longer. And there is a push to try to go towards more and more, um, I, I don't quite know what to call them, but maybe more fundamental properties that are not so attached to the specifics of a particular planet or the, the particulars of a specific uh, chemical system. Um, my list that I share with students all the time in different classes, uh, Dr. Boston's most excellent uh, 
laundry list of life is, is what I call it. And for me, um, there are certain properties that, that matter tremendously. One is, uh, that I think is paramount, is the ability to export entropy to the outside. So the disorderedness of a system is something that life is wonderful at keeping at bay. And we do this at the expense of energy. So we have mechanisms for taking energy into ourselves in one way or another as organisms, and we make ourselves more ordered. And we uh, essentially keep thermodynamics temporarily at bay for the period of time that we're alive. To me, this seems like an extremely fundamental property. Um, but that's a subtle thing to be able to measure, right? Uh, there are other properties that are, that are probably uh, universal but difficult to measure. It may be that certain patterns that organisms in a community arrange themselves in may be universal. It may have to do with acquisition to materials, conditions that those organisms need. So there may be higher order mathematical patterns that we see. Um, there is certainly the transformation of materials on the interior of organisms and the export of waste products. In earth microbiology, we know that there are many organisms that do this, not only with what we consider food or organic materials, but also rock and mineral materials. Um, oxidation of metals, for example, is a wonderful way that many microbes have of running their physiology. So looking at substances, not only that are the kind of organic chemicals that we are made out of on this planet, but also looking where in the mineral uh, world on a particular planet, there may be little pockets of energy is important. If we want to focus more uh, narrowly on the kind of life that we have here, of course, one of the things that our broad community has been doing for many decades is trying to come to grips with things like the temperature limits to life. Uh, what we think we know about the temperature limits to life on this planet right now, um, still sort of sketchy at the both ends of the spectrum. Um, we have absolute confirmation of organisms growing, um, presumably quite happily, as high as 122 degrees centigrade under pressure because boiling is a mechanically disruptive and, and destructive process. But we certainly, of course, have been looking at places like the um, subsurface or the hydrothermal belts in, in the, uh, the, down into the subsurface of the ocean uh, that act as conduits for very hot materials. There have been many reports, anecdotal reports, that have not been able to be followed up on in the laboratory, um, suspecting that that limit to life at the upper end, even for our kind of chemistry, is perhaps closer to 150 degrees centigrade. Um, but until you actually demonstrate it unequivocally, then it's simply science fiction um, or a tantalizing set of clues. It's not really science. So uh, that's what we know about the upper end to life uh, temperature scheme. Uh, on the lower end, it becomes more subtle still. Um, recently, we've been trying to wrangle with this issue because one of the important things uh, that Mars um, experiences, perhaps, is great changes over relatively short geological periods of time in how habitable it may be. And so we're interested in whether or not organisms could sort of hang out during the bad times and, and, uh, and be available to uh, reawaken, so to speak, when conditions on Mars get nicer. From the mission point of view that, uh, that Mary will talk about uh, in a little while, obviously we're concerned about um, not contaminating where we go. And so it's become not only an item of academic interest, but an item of uh, operational interest, just exactly what organisms can tolerate in terms of cold temperature and dryness. And cold temperature and dryness often go together. Um, the lowest limits to life at which we believe that organisms can actually show that they are capable of reproduction, not just hanging out, uh, but capable of reproduction, seems to be about minus 18 degrees centigrade. These were the coldest, um, really legitimate, systematic types of analyses that have been done. 
Um, there are a number of anecdotal pieces of evidence in the literature that try to show that that's the case at somewhat colder temperatures, um, but those are not done in very closely controlled uh, circumstances. So there again, tantalizing clues, but that minus 18 degrees centigrade uh, limit seems to be at least uh, pretty defensible. Um, we know that dryness, of course, is a big problem, and, and one of the things that has motivated a lot of the um, exobiology and astrobiology work that's been done <clears throat> with respect to planetary habitats, of course, is looking for where, <clears throat> excuse me, liquid water um, may be available, and this is important because we believe that organisms uh, must have some access to liquid water of some sort. However, how they actually get that is really quite debatable, and the degree to which that's debatable only came to my attention, really, uh, because of this recent work that I've been helping with, trying to you know, understand what are known as special regions on Mars. And it appears that there are legitimate claims that lichens, these symbioses between fungi and a photosynthetic partner, uh, that are such remarkable sort of joint organisms can seem to take up water from directly from the vapor phase. There are lots of reports of this. Um, we didn't feel that the evidence was completely clear and convincing at the high level of proof that we needed, but nevertheless, it leads one to think that that may be a possibility. Um, the um, opposite end of all of this, which is sort of focuses on um, the physics of the system is, is the chemistry of the system. And so there are certainly particularly challenging chemical circumstances that actually have physical manifestations. And one of these is the osmotic strength of the environment. So um, if you're not familiar with that term, um, the number of, or the, the concentration of material that is dissolved in a fluid, water for example, um, is its osmolarity. And this means that an organism that is living in a solution that is saturated with dissolved materials has a harder time getting access to the water, even if it's floating in an aqueous medium. So for example, consider a microbe floating in a saturated brine. It's got plenty of water. That brine is water. But the brine has so much salt of different kinds um, dissolved in it, that the organisms have a very hard time accessing that water. And this is because the water inside their cells tends to want to flow out of them and um, help to dilute the environment more. So they have a problem of holding on to their own water and they have a problem with getting additional water from the outside. Now, there are many organisms that do this quite successfully. Um, we have had many discussions in the community about um, how saturated is saturated. Can organisms get water, those that are adapted to these conditions, um, when they're in a saturated solution of every kind of salt, or is it just some kinds of salts? Um, there's still a lot of thinking and work going on in that direction. Um, this is also true for the toxic effects of, of many elemental materials or other compounds, particularly those that involve metals. So we certainly know that there are um, uh, significant toxic effects for most organisms from things like um, uh, mercury, from elements um, like copper or chromium. And yet there are a whole suite of organisms that have methodologies that they employ in their metabolism to actually endure very high concentrations of these materials. And some of them actually have remarkable ways of detoxifying this. So one of my favorite examples uh, that comes from uh, uranium-rich environments um, is the transformation that some organisms make to make a more soluble form of uranium into a less soluble form of uranium and have that uranium compound precipitate out, which means that it's no longer in a soluble form and able to be toxic to them. And they spend actually energy doing that. So they actually take uranium and they spend energy to actually chemically reduce it because that takes it out of circulation from their point of view. So even 
in the arena of toxicity, there are many tricks that organisms have evolved over time uh, to handle that. The last item I want to touch on uh, briefly is the whole issue of uh, radiation of one sort or another. So when we say radiation, that means a number of different things. One uh, type of concern for organisms is ultraviolet light. So very short wavelength, high energy, uh, 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 ultraviolet wavelengths coming from the sun, of course, can be tremendously destructive of our kind of chemistry. There are repair mechanisms that organisms have developed, and they employ those to help um, ameliorate the damage. Their systems for doing that repair are actually activated by visible wavelengths of light, interestingly enough. So um, I don't want to dwell on my own work, but one of the things that we have uh, been studying in cave organisms is whether or not they retain that machinery. And typically they don't, because they don't need to repair against UV. However, the other end of this radiation situation for organisms is by way of a very high energy particles, so ionizing radiation from uh, the galaxy as, as a whole. I, I'm sure we all know that there's galactic background radiation uh, that is coming from elsewhere, um, many, many different stellar and, and, uh, uh, and related processes, of course, are giving off these very high energy materials all the time. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a constant for any given uh, part of the, uh, of the galaxy. But there are also, of course, um, high energy particle events, uh, coronal mass ejections from our own sun that are episodic, and uh, those, of course, are also very challenging. So organisms here again have some mechanisms that they obviously employ in order to repair damage from this kind of uh, situation. There are some organisms that are quite famous for doing this. Um, there is a, an organism whose genus name is Deinococcus, and I think it's just been changed to something else because uh, taxonomists can never leave well enough alone. <laughs> I forget what the new name is, but uh, these guys are famous because you can bombard them with you know a million rads or more, and uh, they seem to be able to tolerate that, and in fact continue to grow. They have a combination of extraordinary repair mechanisms, but they also have um, chemical ways that their biomolecules are more stable against uh, this kind of radiation. They may not have developed that for the purposes of dealing with radiation repair. Um, they seem to also be quite uh, adapted to tolerating those briny conditions that I mentioned before. So this radiation resistance may actually be an evolutionary um, accident or byproduct, really, of that original, uh, you know, uh, that, or, that original adaptation. So um, what I can say from my long experience in extreme environments is that every time we think we're moving into an environment on this planet where it's so nasty that we're not going to be able to find uh, anyone alive, we turn out to be able to find at least some organisms that are living in that environment. And this is true for the subsurface of the Earth, the uh, ocean floors, these hydrothermal uh, vent smokers. Um, even more recently, a whole new set of work is coming out looking at high altitude organisms, not just surviving being lofted through things like the jet stream, but actually potentially being reproductive in that condition. So we're still pushing at the envelope of what we know about life here, and then of course trying to extend that beyond this planet to these more general conditions that we would find on other planets. So that's the spiel. So keep all that in mind for a little while because I'm going to go somewhere completely different from that in a little while. But before we go there, would you say a little bit, not too much, about the Viking approach to looking for life? Well, I was just going to say I'm going to take you back 50 years. Um, Penny has done a very good job at telling you sort of how the complexity with which we look at life now, but we didn't start out that way. We started out very uh, anthropocentric, understanding what we needed. We needed to eat, we needed to drink, we needed water, just the basics. Um, <clears throat> we needed energy so that we could do work. 
And we applied those basic concepts and what, how we understood biology through our own eyes to, uh, to designing experiments and plans for looking for life elsewhere. So the very first experiment that was, or, or instrument that was funded by NASA back in 1957 was something called a wolf trap, which was a life detection experiment that was supposed to be flown on Viking. And unfortunately, like often happens with things, the, the development got more complex and more importantly, heavier until it weighted itself right out of being an instrument that was taken on board the two landers that we sent to Mars in the mid 70s. Uh, at that time, again, we were thinking very anthropocentric. We were thinking about what, what did, you know, even if we weren't thinking about ourselves, what did it take for us to grow um, plants? We needed water and we needed some nutrients. You add it to the soil and boom, you get life and, and things sprout and grow. And so we sort of applied that theory um, because up until that point, we really didn't understand extremophiles, which is very much what, what Penny was talking about, life that's been able to take advantage of every single niche on Earth, no matter how harsh we might find it, it's not very extreme to them, and they've figured out how to cope. So when we sent the two landers to, to Mars, one went somewhere around the equator and the other one a little further north, they were basically uh, the exact same suite of, of instruments on board um, the, the lander, and we sent it with three experiments to look for life. The first one um, I'm going to tell you about was just wondering if... Um, well, we knew that everything that we knew about was made out of carbon, and we knew that there were a lot of organisms, including ourselves, that need to eat carbon in order for us to exist. So we thought, let's look at the soils and let's see if, well, first of all, when we landed, we looked around and we didn't see anybody waving. No green men, nothing obvious, and we had certainly planned ahead of time not to look for that. We were actually going to be looking for microbes. Um, and so... As I mentioned, one of the things that we thought about were organics. So we did a set of experiments where the arm of the lander put materials from the surface into, um, and I think even some stuff from under a rock, you know, thinking about that radiation protection, into vials and first just looked at if you could detect organics by heating unamended, you know, we've done nothing to these Martian soils, or I guess they're not technically soils because they didn't have organics in it, so the regolith, just to see if you could get through heating evolution of compounds that would suggest that there were organics in the soil. So that set of experiments yielded signals that were, were so small, in fact, it indicated that the amount of organics in the soil, in the regolith on Mars was less than samples that we had looked at from uh, Apollo returned samples from the moon. So less organics than even these lunar samples. The second experiment that we did, we thought, okay, let's see if we can get things to metabolize. Let's add some water and some nutrients and see if we can't get them, uh, the, if there are hidden microbes in these soils, to take them up and produce various gases that are indicative of life metabolizing. One of them is oxygen, so if something's photosynthesizing, it can take up um, inorganic CO2 and it can make, um, it evolves oxygen. So we look for oxygen, we look for CO2, which is what you breathe, uh, it's a respiratory product, and we looked for methane and I think nitrogen and a couple of other gases. Um, this was after incubating the soils for, for a number of, of days. Again, these experiments were repeated on each of the landers. Again, we really didn't see much of anything. And then the third experiment that seemed a little bit more promising was the labeled substrate uh, experiment. So this is a very common thing you do. You know that something's going to use an organic. You label it with a radioactive substance. So you, put, you tag one of the carbons in those organics. You feed it to an organism, and it can take it up. And if it uh, uses it, it will give off radio, uh, C14 labeled CO2. And so we had an instrument set up where we could, again, give it water, give it nutrients, give it labeled nutrients, and then see if it could evolve CO2. And lo and behold, in the initial experiment that was done on both landers, we actually detected radioactive CO2. So we had um, gaseous or labeled products that came out of, of those experiments. The experiments, like all good scientists, even landers and rovers know to repeat what they've done. And so they collected more soil. Uh, they, actually, they took, I believe they took the exact same soils, added a new batch, and this time it didn't evolve any radio-labeled materials. 
So the scientists concluded that that was, that that was inconclusive, and the other two experiments had, had told us that there were probably wasn't, wasn't life um, there as well, at least at that particular spot in that little piece of soil <laughs> within that tiny little area around, uh, around the lander. Um, since then, we've learned a little bit more about what might have been a problem with those experiments, and we've also learned more about what the capabilities of, of organisms. And so our experiments have, have be, or, or our ideas about how to look for life have, have improved. Um, before I turn it over to you, I just want to add a couple of stories uh, about extremophiles that I like to talk about because I think it's fun. So Dinococcus, whatever it's called now. Um, I mentioned that you know, 50 years ago, we thought about everything in terms of ourselves. So we never thought that who could possibly live inside of a, you know, a, a cooling tower uh, at, a, at a nuclear power plant, or who could withstand a tinned can of meat being irradiated by gamma radiation? Well, I'll tell you who, Dinococcus. That was how we first found that organism. It wasn't doing anything elaborate. It was, in fact, we've learned lots about the extreme conditions that organisms can survive and thrive in to protect ourselves from, in, uh, from either infection or spoilage. Um, and so we, we found Dinococcus in a can of tin spam. Um, never know where you're going to find things. My other interesting story about extremophiles, um, they can ex survive in extreme levels of pH, both acidic and very basic environments. And my favorite is a suit that was brought against the Pepsi-Cola company a number of years ago for someone who claimed that they had found a mouse in their mo Mountain Dew. And the defense was, no, the pH of Mountain Dew is 2.5, and there's no way you would find a whole mouse in a can of Mountain Dew. Maybe goop, but never a whole mouse. So that, that uh, lawsuit was thrown out of court uh, based on convincing them that, that it was a too harsh a, a, a condition for something like a mouse to survive. But it turns out that there are organisms, I mentioned that was 2.5, there are organisms that can survive at zero, pH of zero. That's, that's more acidic than battery acid. Um, so in case you can't tell, the two of us are very excited about microbes. <laughs> we think that they roll. Uh, we know this is a humans to Mars um, uh, conference, but it's important to realize that there's other biology and other possibilities, and we've learned a lot through studying microbes. Yeah, aren't humans just host to lots of microbes? <laughs> yes, we that's true, too. Yes, we couldn't artists. live without them. <laughs> Whether we study them or ingest them or have them on our skin, you're right. We'll take them to Mars with us. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, <laughs> thanks. So now you've got a little bit of the backstory. I want to take you to the problem of how you look for life. But we have to have a little bit of a prologue for how you look for life, and that is why would we look for life? And the reason why we would look for life uh, is not one, it's many. First of all, if we send things elsewhere, we'd like to know what kind of conditions we're sending our things to. If it's a spacecraft, it's one thing. We send the spacecraft to do a job, and so when we want to look for life on the spacecraft before we send it, it's for two reasons. One, we don't want to despoil the environment so that we're confounding it with what we know is our own biota. And the second reason is because it's a little bit like the uh, Star Trek directive. We would like to understand environments native to their process without adding to the process. Now, we've all taken physics, so we know that that's actually impossible to completely avoid. But we have reasons for looking for life. They go beyond the search for life just because we'd like to know if there is anyone out there. With respect to what we have done in the past, what we do now, and what we might want to do insofar as it has implications for humans exploring Mars, I am going to just lay on the table for the moment the notion that we should completely forget about the life. Forget about Mars organisms, forget about Earth organisms for just a minute. I want to talk to you about the environmental requirements for a habitable planet. If you take a look at Mars, it does not look like Earth. And it doesn't take a lot of education to know that. 
It's a little more than half the size of the Earth, and you already know it's further away from the Sun, and you also know that it's fairly close to Jupiter, and you probably know something of the late heavy bombardment that happened 4.1 to 3.9 billion years ago, during which time lots of large impactors slammed into the rocky bodies in the inner solar system. During the time that Earth evolved life, it went through many challenges that it was able to withstand because it was stabilized by the moon. So right away we know that the Earth-Moon system is a different kind of environment than the Mars environment. It is a more stable environment. And the reason why I am bringing that up to you is because features like dynamics and environmental stability play a big role in the habitability of an environment, not just at any given moment, but in the evolution of the habitability potential of an environment. With Mars, this is really, really important because Mars apparently was not able to withstand the late heavy bombardment and have intact some of the key physical forcing functions that save us from attack by ionizing radiation. The geodynamo, or whatever you'd call the Mars dynamo, uh, no longer exists. We do know that Mars at one time had a magnetic field. We know that the value of the magnetic field goes even beyond allowing a radiation belt, a protective sphere around the planet that will keep cosmic rays, both galactic and solar, from penetrating down to the surface. It also allowed Mars to, I'm sorry, it allows Earth to maintain an atmosphere so that when the planet outgasses, its lighter materials stay. That's how come we have an atmosphere. All the planets that are rocky off-gas the lighter materials. But how well those lighter materials stick around is a function not just of their chemical potential, but the physics that enable that. So while we were able to maintain an atmosphere without having it ripped away by cosmic rays and solar energetic particles, Mars was not. So it's kind of like a positive feedback loop of destruction. Mars, without a magnetic field, not only could not protect its surface from ionizing radiation, couldn't keep its atmosphere. Why do we care about that if, say, for example, we wanted to go there? The reason we care about that is because the inventory of light and reactive gases that we need just is not the same at Mars as it is on the Earth. So there's a fundamental set of chemical differences that have to do with the abundances of the light gases. Mars in its interior right now does not hold water as its dominant volatile. So if we're thinking we're gonna drill down and find these lenses of water, it's possible we might find some, but the major volatile in the Martian interior is chlorine. So we're dealing with a Clorox planet. And we know that to be true, not only because of what we've seen trapped in meteorites that are from Mars, but also because now we have three different landed missions on the surface of Mars that have seen oxidizing chlorine compounds on the planetary surface. Now that's maybe not so bad if what you're looking for is oxygen to use for fuel, what we call in situ resource utilization, but if you're trying to understand whether or not the planet is habitable on its surface, it's kind of bad news because it drives the chemistry to a state where everything is extremely oxidized. And what we know about metabolic strategies for life on Earth, life likes to buy and sell electrons just like some people like to buy and sell stocks. So it's very hard to buy and sell electrons if you're way far to the right on one end of the chemical reaction spectrum. I might seem to be jumping all around here, but I'm gonna tie this all together for you and get on with why we need to look for life and what it means. The physical environment completely controls 
the inventory of available chemistry, not just the chemical environment, the reaction potential, but what's left, what the players are. So when I think about whether or not the surface of Mars is habitable, I'm not thinking it's all that habitable because of the inventory of not just chemical elements at that surface, but the variety of pretty heinous, awful physical conditions that are ready to attack not living things, but the chemicals. So first and foremost, marshal your resources. The resources are chemical resources. Now, looking for life on Mars right now is officially not something that we're doing on Mars with Mars Science Laboratory, the current in situ mission sitting on the surface of Mars. We are trying to characterize the habitability potential of Mars. Why do you think we're trying to do that rather than just flat out look for life? Yeah, go ahead. So if I may paraphrase you just to make sure I understood what you said, you're saying there's some stuff we got to know before we can look for life. Is that Or, or it? past habitability. Or past habitability. Past habitability. What's your thought? Or, uh, you know, we can provide the field or walk around the surface Okay. And what do you have to say? Not exactly, but I, I take your point. And, and in fact, that, that's very similar to the approach I would take. Uh, I would like to just see if anybody else has anything to say. Yeah. Boundary conditions. Okay. What did, were you going to say? I was going to say that the current missions don't have access to currently habitable environments. Okay. So I, I'll tell you how I think about it. There is no right answer, by the way. I just wanted to know what you all thought. So I wouldn't know Martian life if it bit me on the butt. <laughs> and that's just because we are all a function of the environment in which we evolved. We have evolved with the materials we have because that's what was here. And so, from my perspective, and, I, and the mission wasn't designed with me at the helm, I'm just telling you what I think. I know what minerals look like. I know what the chemical elements look like, and I know how they behave, and we know which ones are on Mars because we have samples of Mars from meteorites, and also from Viking, we have data from Mars, and we have orbital data from Mars. We have a lot of information about Mars that tells us we can trust that the periodic table of the elements is robust and that there aren't undiscovered elements that are sitting there on Mars that with a half-life long enough that we could see them. And we know that the minerals that form are the same kinds of rock-forming minerals we see on Earth. I can tell you what Martian bedrock is made of to the extent that we've examined Martian bedrock. And I can tell you something about the sedimentary rock that's on the surface of Mars. Minerals, rocks, landforms, that's all stuff that we can see and we can observe. That is stuff that looks like stuff that occurs as a function of thermodynamics and kinetics. So we can depend upon that. Life is really squirrely. 
it can do all kinds of weird things as a function of its environment. So all of you kind of alluded to the fact that we need to know the environment really well in order to be able to have a backdrop against which we could investigate those things that are anomalous from the chemistry that makes rocks. So I'm going to leave that out there as a first assumption. The second thing is, partly due to the, the, the case stated by Penny that life is way more surprising than we expect it to be, and the results of Viking that Mary talked about, what we know of Mars is that we have to expect unexpected chemistry that we're unfamiliar with because we don't have the same set of conditions and the same available set of elements in any particular configuration on Earth. Everything is a little bit unique. Certainly we know the temperature range of Mars. We have places on Earth with those temperature ranges. Certainly we know all these chemicals. But when we approach Mars, we have to approach Mars with such a different set of binoculars than we would have on Earth. If I took a little bit of water and dumped it out on the surface of Mars, it doesn't require a lot of imagining to get it, that it's going to sublimate right away. Even at the equator, it's going to go away. There are warm periods, but there's this Henry's Law problem. You've got this very tenuous atmosphere, and things that are going to go into a gas, the way the vapor pressures are, they're going to go into a gas. So if we go backwards from that and we start thinking about the environmental requirements that Penny was starting to touch on, if you want to hold on to materials inside your little package of boundary-laden body, the moment you start to exchange gases, you're not exchanging gases, you're just giving them away. And you can't get them back. So these are the kinds of problems that are very difficult. Now, let's fast forward beyond all of this requirements-driven stuff to why we would look for life. Why we would look for life in the context of humans to Mars is we certainly need to understand whether or not Mars is pathogenic. And we also need to understand can the requirements for our life be met on Mars? So those are two first-order questions that in the humans to Mars context have to be answered. Is there something bad there that's going to kill me? I can tell you right now, there's something bad on Mars that's going to kill us. Uh, and Penny already mentioned it, and Mary touched on it too. It's the ionizing radiation. It is real bad. We've been measuring it every day ever since MSL landed. In fact, we measured it before we landed as we cruised to Mars. And we know the radiation environment really well. By the way, it's not a showstopper on the surface of Mars with respect to organisms that have repair mechanisms for a limited amount of time. It's worse in space, cruising to Mars. The problem is, if you sit there for a while on the surface of Mars, and believe me, it's going to be a while when the first humans go, because you have to be able to take the amount of time to get to Mars, not to mention the return trip home. So unless you really are on the one-way trip, and even then, you have to find protection from radiation. Now here's the new information that came out in a science paper in December. And that has to do with the ambient radiation environment on the surface of Mars not being quite as bad as the ambient radiation environment during cruise to Mars. Could we go down into the ground to escape from it? So remember that part about we know something about Martian minerals and about the chemical elements that we detect? So the bad news is you can't go down too far because the geotherm and the radiotherm, the, the, the amount of ionizing radiation you get as background from the minerals is also bad news. What does that tell us? It tells us two things. One, if we're going to look for life on Mars, perhaps we need to look for a sweet spot, not too hot from the stuff coming from the planetary interior, the stuff meaning the ionizing radiation, not too hot from the ionizing radiation coming down to the surface. Okay, so that gives you some direction. Do we need to drill down on Mars kilometers? Because that has been in the peer-reviewed literature that we need to get down a long way to get, get enough density of rock to protect us 
from ionizing radiation. It basically means, you know, maybe uh, a meter would be okay if you were looking for some sweet spot for bacteria. For us, no. And that has to do with what our repair mechanisms are like, how long they take, what they require, etc. Okay, so why we would look for life on Mars is in the humans to Mars context, we need to know if there's bad life there that's going to harm us. We need to know if there's good life there that is useful for in situ resource utilization purposes. And we need to know if there's an indigenous biosphere that we're going to harm. That's not because of human safety concerns. That's because of human ethical concerns. Do we really want to be fruitful and destroy? Or do we want to try to live in somewhat of a more harmonious way with the Martian landscape than we have sometimes lived with our own landscape? So these are ethical questions, which are valid and important considerations. Now, I don't want to suck up any more time with this backstory stuff. I want to get to how we look for life on Mars with MSL so that we can get to how we're going to look for life on Mars. And I can surrender this microphone to these two who are way smarter than I am. The way MSL is approaching its study of Mars, as I said, is not to look for life, but to try to understand the environment. We have, as you all know, because you read, found an environment that is of a high potential from a chemical perspective to have been suitable to support life. It is not radiometrically dated at any younger than the age of formation of the planet. But it is dated in terms of its exposure age when it was exhumed so that we could examine it at much younger than the age of the formation of the planet, about 70 to 80 million years. So what that tells us is there are remnants of ancient Mars that are reachable from the surface of the planet. And we know how to look for past conditions so that we can compare them against present conditions. As Mars Science Laboratory progresses in its mission and starts climbing up Mount Sharp, we'll be looking at younger and younger rocks. And presumably, we'll be able to find some that were exhumed recently enough so that they haven't been attacked chemically and by radiation, so that we can get a handle on precisely how conditions have changed chemically and physically as Mars has evolved. That will give us a little bit more of a sense of whether or not Mars could have evolved life. Now, will it tell us if Mars has any life now? No. We're one rover in a crater at the equator. It would be ridiculous to think that we can give you a definitive analysis of whether or not life exists on Mars. For that, we rely on subsequent missions. We rely on orbital data that tells us something of the frequency of change in the chemical composition of the atmosphere. We rely on remote sensing data that we get from Earth. And we continue to rely on the data we get from the in situ investigations still live on the surface of Mars. Presently, opportunity and curiosity. When 2020 goes, then we'll have a third asset when ExoMars goes, we'll have a fourth a uh, asset. Actually, uh, ExoMars is 2016, right? So it'll go before 2020. So as we accumulate assets, assuming that they, they all go to the same place, we get a better picture of the whole planet. So now, how we approach going forward, whether there is life on Mars and where we would go if we were humans. I think we've got to talk about what the next two missions are going to do before we get to uh, your speculation about where we're going to go. And we're going to have plenty of time for, for your conversation. So I'd like you, Mary, to talk about what's on the horizon for next trips to Mars and what those are going to do. Okay. I, would, I would constrain it to just exit Mars in, in uh, uh, 2020 uh, as opposed to right. orbitals. Probably not allowed to talk about anything else. <laughs> um, so, um, so do most of you know about ExoMars? I'm assuming it's a European, um, an ESA mission, and it's a life detection mission, and they have on board a drill that will go. Um, I'm not sure the exact half a meter, two meters. Two They'll meters. definitely two meters. 
I know that they had tested it well to a to a half a meter. Uh, okay, so um, to collect samples, and they have um, uh, a life chip marker test. So they're looking at various compounds that are related to again far, uh, focusing on life as we know it. So it's a suite of compounds that we know um, that and the system is based on being able to detect those. So um, I have, think that they have a little bit of a challenge in terms of limit of detection, but they're going right for the, the prize. Uh, answering the question, which again, I think people need to keep in mind, part of the scientific process is you get the answer uh, to the question that you ask based on how you design the experiment. So the ExoMars rover is going to answer the question if there is life on Mars that looks like life on Earth, not the more generic question of if there is life on Mars. And so I think that that's always really important to keep in mind. Uh, and I think a lot of the discussions in moving forward to do these sorts of experiments and measurements are based on, okay, so it's easy enough to look for what we know. How do we look for what we don't know? And that starts getting back to some of the discussion that Penny had about going to some fundamental processes that are more abstracted about, but still appear to be universal for any kind of life um, that, we, that we do know about or that we could even conceive. Uh, the solutions might be different. The biomolecules they choose to use might be different. The way they get their energy might be different. But fundamentally, you know, they, they have these requirements and they leave a certain um, you can't imagine having something that's life that doesn't disrupt the environment around it in, in, in terms of it, the entropy. So there are some, some of the searches in the future, I think, going beyond what ExoMars is doing, will have to have those considerations when they, they think about a strategy for searching for life itself. Uh, the strategy for 2020 um, revolves a think pretty strongly about the limitations of the sorts of measurements that we can make on Mars through robotic systems. And the guy over here mentioned that one of the reasons that we might want to go to Mars and make, is that humans can do a lot more than a rover can do in a shorter amount of time. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, you know, the, the, I think we have a uh, set of, what is it, uh, orbit, land, rove, and bring back samples. And so 2020, which is the, if anybody saw Jim Green, that's, that's the mantra in the Planetary Sciences Division. And so one of the hopes for 2020 is that it will explore another area of Mars, look for areas that are potentially habitable and that could preserve um, signatures of life and collect those samples to bring those, them, to cache them to eventually be brought back. So the question is, if you know your approach to looking for life, then you have a better sense of whether you're bringing your big igneous rock hammer, which is sizable, or you're carrying your little tiny sedimentary rock hammer, I'm not biased, <laughs> or you're bringing your 3D printer, so I wanna know what you're going to do, and somebody else is gonna ask this question a lot more rigorously it's going to be engineers who are going to say, precisely what do you need it to do? Because I can't build it if you can't tell me the requirements. So we have to decide what we're going to do so that we know what to bring. Go ahead. Uh, I, you brought a good point about singularity. Uh, Would just be a chance of robotics. But no, I mean, the thing is we can do, we can kind of, we, there's a gray area that we don't, we don't really foresee as you know, being implemented. But if we have a station, um, like a lab, Well, we can, we can essentially uh, deploy um, sort of like brain to computer interface, you know, AI, you know, robots. So we're, we're up there, but we're, at, we're also manipulating these robots as, as we are, you know, as we're orbiting. So we're still, we're not technically on Mars, but we're, we're using our hands and, and everything to pick up things while we're in the station. So we're not um, connecting with some Earth. And I still think that, no, no, no. I think if I listen to Sarah and Penelope, and she says, if I'm there, there are so many processes going in my brain or you know, experience, and I'm, I'm wondering whether it's also smell or sound or whatever. It's more, it's being there, it's being the tree around you that probably helps you to determine things. And All right, so freeze it right there, because I'm going to ask you a question. Are, are you familiar with augmented reality? Because <laughs> you're not going to be smelling anything without augmented reality. 
So the question is, if what is important to you is the intangible sensory things that give you something that we also can't describe, what level of augmented reality do you need on Mars? Uh, it's a field, so I have big blocks, and so I want to really feel. What and what I do they do? Do you have a little electrodes in your fingertips so that you can feel more than pressure? Or? So I hope you're writing down all your requirements. What else? This is, uh, okay, I'm, I'm picking this up as I go along. I have severe allergies. If you use me, if you use me as a smoke detector in the room, because I can taste it when somebody's smoking outside the door. Agree with me too. How many geologists in here? How many people lick rocks when they go in the field? <laughs> we all do that. It's not a good idea in some environments. But. <laughs> so, not to be a buzzkill, though, can I just add something? I mean, there are some things that we do better than instruments. I think in terms of detecting moisture, yeah. I'd rather have a, an instrument. Mm -hmm. But detecting things like sulfur, our noses are far more sensitive than any instrument in detecting that. So I think, again, it's got to be a marriage of there are definitely things that instruments do better than we do, and it's the, the cognitive part, besides the arguments that I've heard for why, we're go, why we need to go, is we can do it faster. And then we, if you get into better, it, it all stems around having real-time experience and not wasting time testing something and getting information back because you'll know because of the context, um, and, and you know there's no way to impart your experience onto the rover, and you spend or, or any other robotic system. So you are going to be encased in a robotic yeah, system on people. Mars. I was so thinking spacesuit, spacesuit, spacesuit. So I'm not going to smell anything. I'm not going to feel anything. But, no, that, but, but that's not bad, because if you're, you're telling me that we need yeah. to smell something and we need to feel something, you're writing a set of requirements. Okay. If we want to go to Mars and we have to find a way to pay, to go to Mars, we have to make a really good argument for what we are going to do there. And if we are going to budget it, we have to say what we'll need. So what I'm trying to do is bring us back to the recognition that Mars is so not Earth, and we so are evolved to function on Earth. What are we going to do on Mars? What do you need so you can do it? Go ahead. I took a Claritin today, and my physiology is definitely different. <laughs> Are you talking about actual temporary physiological changes, or are you talking about genetically modified humans? Both. Okay. What else? He's scary. <laughs> Hell yeah, who wouldn't? <laughs> yeah, I, I think, though, that we're, we're very far out on the evolutionary development. We're highly derived, and the thought of fundamentally changing Yes, you could take better living through chemistry. I love my coffee, I love my Claritin. But, you know, some of what you're talking about that seems, um, so evolutionary studies and adaptation studies are done on things that have very fast um, uh, reproduction times, and I'm just having a tough time imagining this. this well, in a, not, I mean, it's a microphone, but I'm just saying that yeah. I know it's something that's out there, but it's the same thing with like robotics. Singularity—that's unnatural, you know. But it's not. No, we, we're 
it's still you replacing to the very, very small time scale that we've existed on Earth. But everything else has adapted over millions of years. We are the first generation of anything on Earth that can actually implement evolutionary change faster than millions of years because of the time and all the things that are just the capacity of all these years. Uh, the different organs now and everything, we are moving faster than the world is ever. So. And those are fair ideas to put on the table. Well, it, this is not about advocacy necessarily. The, the, what we are trying to get to here is it sounds like a lot of us think that there are intangibles that can be observed directly in the field. And, and what I want to remind us all is that we're still going to be doing remote sensing on Mars. Yeah. Well, and so the question is, how are we going to do it? So Artemis actually mentioned that she just wants to turn over a rock. We do that now when we... Yeah, so but she's still going to need a glove. I yeah. mean, the point I'm making no, is... No, you can actually do it. So the point I was going to make is that I, I work on hydrothermal vents. And even when we go down in a submarine, we're not touching any of that stuff. We're, I, I hope not. not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you do when you bring it back to the surface, sure. but you're not. You're still doing a, doing a fair amount of science either within something like Alvin that actually takes you down there or even remote operations with something like Jason. And it's that arm comes in and scoops something up and looks at you know can can press and get a, a, a hardness measure of the of the structure. It can flip the rocks over and see what's under. So there's a lot that can still be done. Why did yes. You bring robots to Mars to do that? Well, Apparently, put it on your list. Yeah. Oh. That's Go ahead. Good. Well, and actually, oh, I can't see. Oh, your hold name on a second. I, I just want to explain to you. Okay, so the question is, what is the prospect of finding water? So the issue is not finding water, it's finding liquid water. And so the problem with finding liquid water is that the measurements that we presently have for looking at its subsurface, for example, we don't really look for water, we look for hydrogen. And so we can't tell the difference between hydrogen that's OH as part of some mineral and water. I mean, we can sort of tell by the intensity differences. There's an instrument on Mars Science Laboratory that is doing this. And we have orbital data from Odyssey that does this. But as far as the prospect for finding it, what we have done suborbitally and also in situ, which is in our one crater near the equator, has not given us but a taste, a small little bit of the planet. So if there is water a lot deeper in an actual lens, in an aquifer, then it's possible that it's there and we haven't seen it. I don't know. Now the question you asked was, what are the prospects? So you have to go back to, what is our technological capability and do we have a sufficient technical maturity to get down very deep? Go ahead. Well, that, uh That's right, and Dan can only see down a, a meter. Yeah. So. And Mars is? What stars are you told from Mars is on the Mars Express? So it, much the same way that we've done measurements also with Odyssey, um, we see hydrous minerals everywhere. And so hydrous minerals tells us that at least at the time of um, diagenesis, when the primary rock-forming minerals were altered and they became hydrated, there was water. It's, it's unquestionable. And the landforms that we see, we see the kinds of sedimentary structures that tell us water flowed on the surface. We see other structures that tell us water stood on the surface. So it's unquestionable that it was there. The question is, does it reside in pockets still beneath the surface? And we also know it's on the surface locked up in ice. So there's water. How deep it is and the prospect of finding liquid water, don't know. Yes? question about what is needed. I don't, I don't know if you were trying, if you were about to tell, tell us. us what you think is needed, but I think Mary just hit, hit it on the head partially in terms of where the conversation was going when she made the analogy to um, collecting rocks underwater, bringing them up on surface, and then having like a, a lab to look for stuff. And we can smell it and lick it. <laughs> 
you guys with like yeah. the sample return and whatnot eventually. But the thing is, is you know, we can also do things like genetically modifying humans, and we can do all sorts of cool things. And I love talking about this stuff. But the thing is, is we want to do the stuff now. Yeah. We don't want to do the stuff 30 years from now, or 50 years, or 100 years from now. We want to figure out how to do the stuff now. And so I think that you know we've got to sort of. Um, that's why the sample return is good, perhaps to you know initially, but you know to, to just sort of rely like you know on, on a long-term project to have many sample returns where we're bringing things back to Earth is just going to be very cumbersome, which is why I think what we need is a lab where we can go out and we can pick the stuff up and we can like do some preliminary tests outside. We can turn things over outside and then. On Mars or intermediate? On Mars. Yeah. What were you going to say? Well, sample return as far as I call it is hard. They're just you know trying to figure out. I was used in years. Uh, yes. I think the science head is a billion, and then probably I am doing it on the cheap side. Going sending humans to Mars with the last populations. I yes, uh, I would so just say that Pascal is saying it's a bazillion times more than that. Go yeah. ahead. No, she was saying okay, it's well, one point seven. Okay, well, it's like it's like. On between somewhere between 60 and 100 billion, which means that if you, for a pound of rock, have to, because how much are we going to bring back? A kilogram? Yep. That's the max. So for a kilogram, we pay at least a billion dollars. You know, then of course, figuring out how to send humans and let them do 100 kilograms in the 18 months that they're there makes more sense to me. So remember, th this is not an either or discussion here. This is a conference about humans to Mars. I'm trying to get you to think requirements-driven exploration. So if this is a conference about humans exploring Mars, what do you want to do there, and what is it going to take to do it? Go ahead. in thinking it, it would not be profound if we found life there and it looked like us or because I think that you know just from a philosophical point of view uh, actually we have Margaret in the background she can comment on that um, I, I think that it's a different sort of question it might even be more scientifically interesting if it was different but I think fundamentally I think humans would be happy if there was I mean, would be affected if there was any kind of life form found. And if it looked like us, it means it potentially didn't just happen here. No, well, yeah, no, I completely agree. I'm just, I guess I'm looking at more of us along the lines of an immediate perspective and like in our own and just how to keep how to keep that going. I okay, so let me you know, turn that back around to you. I don't know what you were like when you were a kid. I was really <laughs> irritating. And when I wanted something, and I still am, and when I wanted something, I mounted a campaign the likes of which no one had ever seen before. And it took a long time to convince my parents to get me a two-wheeler, but I did agree to stop sucking my thumb if they did. And, and the point is, if you want to build a level of excitement about your ideas, that's all of us. It's our responsibility to sell those ideas. So 
This is a Humans to Mars conference. If you all are excited about going to Mars, you're going to have to sell it because unless you have really deep pockets, somebody else is going to be sharing the bill. I'd also say it's a mistake to downplay what we are doing currently because then you lose the interest and quite frankly, when MSL landed, that was the most media attention that NASA had gotten in all years up until, you know, in the last 10 years since social media had hit. I mean, the pages were jumping out of the ether as people were hitting and getting information and it continued for a long time and I still, um, it's kind of scary. I've got, I recently had to have a procedure done on my eye and just as they were about to put me under, the guy was asking me questions and I could see he was distracted <laughs> about, oh, you're, you're a, a, a microbiologist that works at NASA. I used to watch Curiosity. I'm like, my eye? <laughs> I mean, people are really, really excited. And I think, I think if you want to ensure the future for exploration and that we do get there, I think it's incumbent not just to talk about the ideas that are out there, but to really talk about how incredible it is what we're doing now. I mean, it is amazing. Let me ask you all a different question. <coughs> we're going to get a little pool going here. <laughs> so what, we have a prize? When are we going? Oh. Oh, 2033, if I have my way. <laughs> and she always says always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm um, getting that sense. I'm So what would that be? What do you think is a critical breakthrough? Reusable rockets. The one. How are you going to say? As somebody who sat up in the middle of the night flying a computer fly for about two hours and a half before, I hate to say this, but I'm, uh, I'm much more jaded now. I think I would predict that if we go to Mars anytime soon, there won't be NASA. Huh. It will be either the Chinese or it will be an independent operator. Okay. Who else has a and prediction of when and we're and going? And I'm not saying that. And, and I don't say we, meaning NASA. I say we, meaning humans. So I don't really care who goes, but I'd like to know when you think we're going. Well, this crowd does. No, actually, I don't. I mean, I don't know if people are responsible. No. Why do you think that I'm asking you this, aside from, you know, have some because more time. we need to get planning on what to bring, and you know, if, if I want to be there in 20 years, I think I'm fine. But you know, if I think our our, our barriers are not are not our own ambition or even um, science, it's it's political will and, and uh, public understanding of why we should. That's the real motivator. I think. So. So I guess I would take this parse to a finer level. What are you going to do? <laughs> At all. You're here, so obviously you're interested in humans going to Mars. Are we, any of us, going to take personal responsibility for going there? or? And, and if so, what is it? I know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Well, I made a film, and that's my contribution. It's my first contribution. It's about people who want to do this. It doesn't focus specifically on Mars, but it focuses on the dream of exploration and trying to find out things that we ask some questions we don't know how to ask, ask yet, and you know, find those answers. So. What he's leaving out is that, that the only place that it, that film was screened, besides a few weeks ago, was uh, on the International Space Station in Mars. So the first orbital from the event got screened. That's very cool. Very cool. Congratulations. I'm the PR coordinator for the film, so I have to but, but, but I think it is, it is, like you just mentioned, uh, we can focus so much on um, the great things that are being done right now. We were focusing on issues that
think it's really important that you've brought up that I think the future of exploration isn't about the extreme sport part of it. Um, as you mentioned, only a few people will be able to go, and so engendering support and enthusiasm from the public is going to be about what it is they're doing and not that, wow, there's a person sitting on Mars. It's because, quite frankly, it turns out I discovered, so Pasadena was where we spent watching uh, MSL land, and I happened to be staying with a, uh, a friend of a friend who's an actor, and he actually believed we had already gone there. <laughs> so apparently there's a whole <laughs> bunch of people that been there, done that, aren't you going out somewhere else? Yeah. we stop it Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, so, but, but the point being, the vision and why are we exploring, it's not just so a few people can, you know, walk around and it, it's because we want to learn more about our solar system or whatever it is that personally motivates you. And I think that that's, that part of the narrative is extremely important to, to convey to the public. So it, it's, so I'm going to kind of wind the conversation down because it's five o'clock and I'm going to leave you with one thing. And that one thing is this. There is no they, and there is no the public. There's only us. Sounds like it's a song. So <laughs> exploration is actually a biological imperative. It's not adventure. Exploration is something that all organisms do. So if you want to go to Mars, there's only you. There's only us. And that's it. Well done.